Hi, I'm Selena from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Jessica Lennon, who is a an author. She's an artist and illustrator, and she does children's books. And uh, I'm going to let you explain what kinds of books and art you do. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. I am an author and illustrator. I've illustrated or written, I think I have over 10 published books now. I have a book coming out next, uh, tomorrow, actually. So that will be my 11th book. Yes. Um, I mainly do picture books. Uh, my most recent book is Jumper, A Day in the Life of a Backyard Jumping Spider, which hopefully is in the frame here. Um, and then I also do fiction and I, I do, yeah, all kinds of things. So mostly, mostly an artist. Uh, that's kind of how I started. And then I've started writing books as well. And I just love the picture book format. I am, I'm a big fan of writing and telling stories for young readers. Okay. So for readers unfamiliar um, with your work, how would you describe the types of books that you, that you write? Um, that's a great question. I, so I live in Colorado and I grew up here and I'm surrounded by nature all the time. There's just these big mountains here and we spend a lot of time outside. And so a lot of my work tends to have to do with the natural world. Um, it's not all nonfiction, but things that have to do with animals or nature or just the experience of what it's like being a creature on our planet and being part of this world. Those are all things that really interest me. And I like to tell those stories in a way that's engaging and dramatic and hopefully makes readers feel like they're really experiencing this other world. So in that book that I was just showing you, Jumper, um, it's about giving the young reader um, kind of a glimpse of what it would be like to be that small and to actually be in that world. So that's what I'm trying to do as an author and as an illustrator. Wonderful. So what um, what can readers expect from your latest book? My latest book? Um, when it's coming out tomorrow? Oh, yeah, the one coming out tomorrow. Yeah, I guess that is the latest book. Um, <laughs> that book is called I'm a Black Hole. Um, and it's written by, you know, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Um, Dr. Eve M. I'm going to try it. Vava Giakis. I might be pronouncing that wrong. I apologize to my author if that's true. It's published by Candlewick MIT Press, and it is a nonfiction book about um, about black holes, about you know these really weird things. Here's the title page: very um, big black hole there, um, and all the science behind them and how we've learned what we know about them, which. They're very still. Uh, they're very mysterious still. Um, there's a lot we don't know, but we have learned many uh, facts through science and through math and physics. So it's all about that, and it also has a bunch of fun adventure to it. So I made a story where this character goes on a magical trip in their spaceship, and it's just kind of like adds an extra fun element to the illustrations. So. She's wonderful kind of a space explorer. So as an illustrator, um, did you didn't get a chance to talk to the author or? I didn't for that book. We often don't get a chance to speak with the author. Occasionally I will have contact with them, but usually it's all sort of done through the publisher. So I'll speak with my editor and I'll speak with my art director or someone like that. But then um they are speaking to the author separately. And the reason they do that is just to avoid any conflict that might come up and to give us each our own separate creative space because some um, some books require that where, where the author might have one vision for it, but the illustrator is also a storyteller and they're being hired as a separate creative mind. We're not just the hands of the author, right? We're we're adding our own elements to these books and sometimes our own narratives even in the pictures. So I think that publishers want to preserve that creative space for us and protect it so that we have room to express our creativity as well. Okay. All right. So getting back to your book, um, what do you think draws readers to these kinds of nature types? I think that 
kids are just naturally very curious about the world around them. So they want to know things. And this book, Jumper, uh, the way the story is structured is kind of a question and answer format. So the text will ask, what if you were very small? You know, what, what if you could climb, you could walk not just on the floor, but also on the ceiling and also on the walls, what would that be like? And that came from a very natural question and answer sort of play that I would do with my own daughter, who was like three or four when I was writing that book. And she was kind of the inspiration for it. It's like, I could see that she was already asking these questions. So I made a book in an effort to help answer some of those questions and give her a little more information so that she could ask some more questions. So I think that young readers are already very perfectly poised to be interested in the natural world, to be interested in what's around them. And my job is just to give them tools so they can explore it even more and they can feel empowered. The thing I love about Jumper is that it's set in a, a community garden. So it's like, you don't have to go to the tropics or the coral reef or the rainforest to discover something new. Nature is right here. It's right in your backyard. It's accessible to everyone, no matter where you live. There's something mm -hmm. to be discovered. So I think that's a really cool idea. Oh, great. That is true. I mean, it's always great to have something that you can see and you don't have to go anywhere. It's yeah. It's right there for you. Yeah. And sometimes we overlook those small things that are just right, right nearby. We're like, oh, that's just a, that's just a, that's just a fly or it's just a mouse or something. But those animals are extraordinary and there's still a lot that we don't know about them. Very true. Very true. So what was the inspiration for Jumper? I had been home, I think it was the pandemic, and I'd been cooped up, not going and doing my normal activities. And so I'd been spending a lot of time in my garden, and I found a little jumping spider uh, in my garden. And I remember that day, you know, picking it up. I did like the, you know, put a cup over it, and you like slide something underneath. You could sort of pick it up and look at it. And that spider was looking at me. I could tell. It was tracking my movement and it had its own experience of that moment. And that got me thinking, I wonder what that experience is for the spider. Um, and I think I, I released it. <laughs> I let it go, came back inside and I sat down on the couch and I wrote out the first draft of jumpers just right there. And that was it. Wow. <laughs> It's interesting how how authors can get ideas for stories just like that. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes they're like these long and stretched out processes, but sometimes you just get that moment where you're like, this is my story. And then I love it when that happens, but yeah. it doesn't always happen. <laughs> okay. And but Jane Yolen <laughs> said that you can find a story in anything. <laughs> She's you right. Can. Yeah. She's yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. So what were the steps that you took to bring it from in initial inspiration to a finished product? Well, I had that manuscript um, kind of written out and then I, I made a dummy. I sketched it out. And so a dummy book, um, if you're an author and an illustrator, is the way that you often present your idea to your agent or to an editor. And it's basically like, exactly what it sounds like. It's a dummy of what your book would be. So it doesn't have full illustrations. It just has little sketches for each page. And you kind of lay out where you would want the text um, to be broken up for the page terms. And you lay out um, just kind of the, the main action that happens on each page. So here the, jump, the jumping spider is, you know, running away from the wasp and here it's catching the fly. So you you see what happens on each page. So I, I created a dummy and I sent it to my agent and then we sent it out to um, my editor who I've been working with, Emily Feinberg at Macmillan. And then um, she liked it and we just started from there. And that was 
kind of the starting point. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of iteration after that, right? A lot of revisions, changes to the story, changes to the art until finally you get to the final product. Now, this is a different question. How would you have felt if you had a different illustrator for your book? For that book? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think that's an experience I haven't had. And I've often wondered what that's like for authors of that letting go, because you can be kind of a control freak when, mm -hmm. when you're the author and the illustrator. It's like everything is within your control. And and then it can also be hard to know what to change. Like if the story isn't working, it's like, should I change the writing or should I change the illustration or should I change both? Um, so I think being only the writer, that would be interesting. I'd have to let go of that piece of myself that wants to um, control everything. And I might've been happily surprised or unhappily surprised. I'm sure it happens both ways for authors. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I could see that would be really difficult for an author to have somebody, you know, do the illustrations, which would maybe change the story a little bit or. Yeah, yeah. I have a <laughs> friend who has been author illustrator and only illustrator who is now for the first time going to be only the writer. So I'm going to ask about that because I think that's a really interesting question. What is that like? Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, it's a surprise. So, I'm sure. So, what kind of um, what kind of research went into to writing this book? Um, yeah, the research was a really important piece because this is a nonfiction book, and um, it has a lot of back matter. So, back here, there's like science facts about you know the organs and the life cycle and how the spider does all these things and I had to learn all this because I'm not I'm not a scientist I don't study spiders my sister's an entomologist so she uh, that helps <laughs> yeah that helps uh I also but I knew I needed more vetting and I needed direct sources you know you want three ideally three independent sources for your information to make sure that you're telling the truth um, you're being accurate to your best ability. And this is going to be a book in a library. Like people are trusting you. Uh, so I, I spoke to several scientists. I, I found people who were so generous with their time. They were just so kind and they looked over my manuscript. They gave me corrections. They drew me diagrams. They, you know, copy edited things and made sure all my Latin names were correct. Uh, and that was just so much fun. It was really fun getting to have Zoom calls with these scientists who are doing really interesting research and are so passionate about spiders. They're just so excited to share what they know. So that was a really fun part of it. And of course, I also read books and watched documentaries and things like that. Um, also for visual reference, you know, because I wanted to make sure I was drawing this animal correctly, too. Mm -hmm. I, you know, my art style is pretty realistic. It's not like a really cartoony version of a spider. So I needed to have the details, you know, the right number of legs, and eyes in the right place, that kind of thing. It sounds like your family has is, is, uh, been in nature for a while. If your sister's an entomologist, yeah, yeah. Lots of biologists and geologists and ologists in the family. <laughs> yeah. It's true. So what is your favorite research story in everything that you've written or, or uh, illustrated? Favorite research story? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I think maybe the most exciting research I, I got to take a research trip, which was really cool. Mm -hmm. I was working on a book called Finding Narnia, and it's about um, C.S. Lewis and mm -hmm. his childhood growing up and his uh, relationship with his brother. And so I knew I needed to go to where he grew up to get to really 
understand it visually and see his home and stuff like that. So I, I took a trip to Northern Ireland and took a boat across to uh, England and went to Oxford where he, where he worked for many years and got to tour his home. So it was really fun to get to do that um, in real life and see it in 3d. And there, there's no, there's really no um, substitute for seeing something in person, you get so much information about a place just from being there. I took a trip recently with a group of authors that called the Children's Book Creators for Conservation. And we went to South Africa for two weeks together. It was nine authors, um, just inspiring, award-winning, you know, Caldecott medal-winning authors and illustrators. And we were there doing real research. You know, we got to put a radio collar on an elephant matriarch and see how that's done and see how, you know, the helicopters there and the, there's the veterinarian there and, and be on the ground um, as part of this conservation research. And it was so fascinating. And, and I got so much out of the experience that I know when that goes into a book, which I'm sure it will at some point, you know, that yeah. happened in October, but you know, the wheels are turning. And I think that that experience will just be invaluable for me as a person, but also as a, as a writer and as an illustrator, because there's so much detail that you just can't get from a YouTube video or a photograph online. And that's why it's great that not every story has to be about a place like, you know, across the world, because sometimes you can't, you can't afford to go somewhere far away like that, or you don't have the time, but if there's something that you can visit in person, right where you are, I think it's just an amazing thing to do. Wow, that is incredible. <laughs> so yeah, definitely like highlight of my life. You know? I can imagine. <laughs> Bucket list. So, so were there any cool facts um, and findings that you discovered when you were uh, when you were researching Jumper that you didn't make it into the book? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they are such interesting animals. Uh, the plot of Jumper, I had to really simplify because it is a picture book and you, I wasn't writing an encyclopedia. So she's trying to hunt and it's about her senses and how she feels vibration and sees things and hears things and experiences her world. But one of the really interesting things about jumping spiders is the way that they dance for each other. <laughs> And that's a reproductive thing that they do. So the male jumping spiders will dance for the females. And some of their dances are extremely elaborate. They have like flashy things they do with their legs. And there's there's vibrations that they make by drumming on the ground and, um, and rubbing parts of their body together to make different sounds. And they have bright colors. So it, and the whole thing is sort of like, Hey, don't eat me <laughs> because if, if the female, the female is usually bigger and stronger. So if the female is hungry, she won't mate with him. She'll just eat him. <laughs> so these oh, males wow. are trying really hard to impress her, but then they're also kind of ready to jump away at a moment's notice. So I think that the way that they dance is really charming. If you have a moment, look it up on YouTube. It's just so fun to watch their little dancing, especially the, uh, I think it's the peacock spider from Australia. I did sneak it into the back matter here, courting danger. But, oh, wow. But he, you can see him there with his rainbow colors and his legs waving around. So it's the male that dances? It's the male that dances, yeah. And and they're great dancers. They really are. What? There's there's somebody on YouTube made a video and it's set to um staying alive. It is is so good. <laughs> Perfect song. <laughs> so good. See, research is fun. Research is fun. Okay. So what was the biggest challenge that you had in writing and putting out Jumper? Oh, um, I think, yeah, the biggest challenge with Jumper was it's about sense, her senses and 
So I needed to show things like sound and vibration in the art, but it's a book and you don't have sound and vibration. So it was a real challenge for me to figure out how to do that visually and make it feel like you were hearing lots of sounds or feel like you were actually seeing, you know, the ground was actually moving um, and do that just through the artwork. That was a challenge. And it was, how, it was did, you do, how did you do that? Um, well, <laughs> I'll leave it to readers to decide how successful. This was the page for the vibrations. So I have just painted them on kind of as, as waves or ah. um, radiating out from, from the, the bird. And then, cause the bird's a predator. So jumper has to avoid. And then for the sounds, I have uh, just this cacophony of hand drawn lettering of all the different sounds in the garden that are happening at the same time. And above them all, there's this kind of buzzing that turns out to be this um, wasp that's coming, which is a big predator for, for spiders. So it was using lettering, it was using line and shapes to try to create a sense of movement. Uh -huh. the, the, the true thing. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So what else can we expect from you in the near future? Well, I do have the Black Hall book tomorrow <laughs> coming out. And then I have uh, uh, my next illustrated book after that is called um, Before You Were Here, which will be out in September. And then right now on my desk, I have, I'm just starting final art for a book called um, in the world of whales, which is about a free diver. It's a true story of a free diver um, who witnessed the birth of a sperm whale in person. So he saw these whales and he thought there was maybe an injury because there was a lot of blood in the water. But as he swam closer, he realized that it was a new birth and all these whales were kind of coming together. And it's a really special story because of the way that the whales kind of welcomed him into that moment. And, you know, even just thinking about it, I get goosebumps because it's, it's, they're very intelligent. They have the largest brain of any animal on earth and they're very social and they're talking to each other. And they, they're, you can tell that it's kind of like the spider. They're thinking about us as much or more as we're thinking about them. So just the, the intelligence and the almost soul of these animals is fascinating to me. And so that's what I'm about to start. That's wonderful. Okay. Uh, are you planning on writing anymore? I am. I have a few manuscripts I'm working on right now, but um, I think- You can't talk about them. Yeah. It's, it's too early to talk about them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> too oh, soon. All right. That's great. So now I have questions about being a writer. What's your favorite part about being a writer um, on the whole writing and publishing process? Um, I, you know what I, lo I love about being a writer is you get to follow your curiosity and it's never the same. It's every project is different and it's a chance to explore and learn something new and push yourself and be creative and do something different. And I've never thrived when I had jobs where it was always the same thing over and over. I, I need that um, curiosity piece. I need to be able to explore. And, it, and being a writer is an amazing way to do that. It's a perfect excuse to anything in the world you're curious about, to contact experts, to read, to find out everything you can learn, to take trips. Um, and meet amazing people, just absolutely inspiring people. So that's one of my favorite things about it. Perhaps I should have said, instead of writer, I should have said storyteller. Yeah, because, because they're both storytelling in a picture book. Yeah, because when you're when you're doing being an illustrator, you're also being a storyteller. Mm -hmm. And sometimes and there's it's, a story in the art that isn't in the text. Yeah, it, uh, do you feel the same way about being a, an illustrator? 
as you do, do. about being I a writer. I feel like they're one and the same. It's like it's like two different brushes. <laughs> there's the words, <laughs> and then there's the the pictures. Okay. And what do you consider the most challenging part of the storytelling process? Um, I think you have that it's been a learning process for me, um, getting to know myself and as a storyteller, as a creative professional, carving out space and establishing habits that support my creativity and allow me to be effective with it. Because if I start to get bogged down in things like self-doubt or anxiety is leading to procrastination, or I'm not taking care of myself, I'm not getting enough sleep, or I'm not um, exercising or like keeping my mind it's like my mind is my tool and I need to take care of it. And that means I have to take care of myself. And I think as a, as a writer and an illustrator, you have to be also your CEO and also your CFO and your marketing person and your bookkeeper and all, you know, all these different things. Uh, so there's a learning curve to figuring out how to do all those things and then protecting space to be creative and learning that you can trust yourself to be creative and that ideas will come because some days they don't. And some days it feels like it's not going to happen and you'll never write a book again. So the sort of believing in yourself uh, is a piece that I've improved at over time and I still could improve at more, but it's challenging for sure. You brought up a very very good point because a lot of people don't think about the fact that you have to do everything that you have to be a bookkeeper and a um, you know some marketing person and everything else um when yeah you're, it's, when it's when really you're hard too you have those days where you think should I just quit and go get a different job like am I gonna make it am I gonna make ends meet and and I think sometimes people on the outside maybe don't understand and they think if you have a book published, you've like got it made or something like that. But um, I think a lot of writers have these worries weighing on them at the same time. And so how do you be creative while also dealing with all that other stuff? Yeah. The work point. in progress. <laughs> <laughs> so you might have already answered this question, but um, when you talked about research, but what has been your favorite adventure? during your writing career or oh, storytelling yeah, yeah. career? I guess those are kind of interlinked, huh? I've had yeah. other, other adventures. I had an adventure turning in the final art for Jumper. I'll tell you that story. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, so I work traditionally, um, which means I'm not making digital art. I'm making physical paintings. I make watercolors that are at the same scale as the, the picture that you see in the book. So there's the, when I'm finished with the book, there's this big stack of paintings and I wrap them up and I put them in a big box. And sometimes I ship them, right? The, I ship them to the publisher. But with Jemper, I was going to New York and I decided I was going to bring them. And it was kind of the tail end of the pandemic. It's like 2021. And I thought, I'll take them with me. And I was taking the train, of all things, Colorado. I, I thought I, I'm going to take Amtrak to New York from Colorado, but I had decided, I think I just needed to get away. So, <laughs> uh, so I'm there on the train with my big box and like, it's the middle of the night and we're in Nebraska and the train stops and we've, we've, it's just dark and quiet. It was like the body snatchers. Like you, it was just silent and and there was no one around and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And finally, hours later, the sun rose and people started to wake up and we realized that the train had broken in the night and lost power. And we had hit a herd of deer in the middle of Nebraska, which oh, is no. tragic, tragic for the deer. But they managed to break the locomotive completely. So we had to wait for this other train to come get us. And it took us... Uh, you know, it was like a freight train engine took us all the way to Chicago at about 20 miles an hour or 15 miles an hour. 
<laughs> so anyway, um, and then I had to take a flight and then the, the you know, book a flight because I wasn't going to make it on time. And then the artwork like didn't fit in the overhead bin and people were yelling at me. And uh, so by the time I got to New York with my box of art, I was feeling like so triumphant that I had finally made it um, after this arduous journey across the country with my box. Um, and this book, this book has a gatefold in it. And I'll, you know, if you don't know the technical terms, which of course we like any industry, we've got our own lingo, um, but this is a, this is a double gatefold. So these are the pages that fold out, right? So this is a pretty big painting in, wow. in real life. So this was a big box. Um, but anyway, that was an adventure. I think in the future, I will not be bringing my art to deliver to New York by train. I think I'm going to go with, I think I'm going to go by with plane. <laughs> trains, <laughs> trains, planes, and automobiles. Yes, right. All I need is a, a boat or something. And then I will have oh, it. Wow. Transport. That is have quite it. an adventure. But. I made it and the, the art made it. So. so so you don't use a computer to uh, to change your artwork around? No, not for my final art. I do use the computer for the sketching phase just because it's a really fast tool. So I'll hand draw things and then I'll scan them in and move things around as needed. Then I'll print that out and then trace it and sketch again. So I do that some. Um, and I'll make little color mock-ups and things. But for my final art, I do it all uh, just by hand. Paintings. Do you, what, what media do you use? I use watercolor and sometimes I use other things. This book has ink as well. So there's like an ink drawing and then watercolor on top of that. Um, I have used a little bit of color pencil sometimes in books. So I'll mix it up, but I almost always use watercolor. Okay. So what is the greatest lesson that you've learned thus far in your in your storytelling career, aside from not taking a train? <laughs> I think um, my greatest lesson would be to not give up. To not give up and to break everything down into very small steps. I guess that's two lessons, but I, I see them as connected together because getting published, getting an agent, making a book, finishing writing a book, all of those things are big things. You, didn't, you don't sit down and do that. You need to, it's like trying to climb a mountain and you just are taking one step at a time. And I believe that if you, you keep working on your craft and keep having a habit of continuing and having grit and not giving up, you will go really, really far. And I started small. I was a member of the SCBWI, which is the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. And I was going to those conferences and putting my portfolio in the show and not winning awards and feeling really small for many, many years. And it took over a decade, you know, to get from there to here, maybe more. I think I started in 2008. So it, it was a long road and I, I'm mostly self-taught in illustration. I never got a degree in it. I never, you know, I, I didn't get a degree in writing. So I think that that just not giving up piece was such an important lesson for me. And to pick yourself up when, when things don't work out and when you fall down, you pick yourself up again and you keep moving forward. That's all you can do. Okay. Is that, um, do you have another piece of advice that you'd like to share with other writers or illustrators? Um, <laughs> well, I could go on. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll talk maybe a little more about breaking things down into small pieces and what a powerful tool that is, because okay. it, it really is some, like some days when things feel like they're not working or I've forgotten how to paint, just 
setting a timer for yourself for a few minutes or telling yourself, I'm just going to get out my paper. That is, and then I can check it off my list. Um, sometimes that's all you need to just get yourself going and getting in the habit of doing it. Say I'm trying to write a book. Well, I get up every morning at the same time. And the first thing I do is I, well, I drink a glass of water <laughs> and I make coffee and I sit down and I write in a journal and I free write whatever comes to mind, whatever ideas come to mind. And I only have to do it for like 15 minutes. And I always sit in the same place in the same chair, rocking chair in the corner of my kitchen. And this practice is so valuable for me because I generate so many ideas that way. And I never expect to, I never plan to, but just the fact that I do it every day, there are some days when nothing, nothing happens. And I'm just, I have no ideas. But then when I go back and look through it, there are other, other days that I wrote something down and suddenly in retrospect, I realized, oh my gosh, I could use this for this other thing. And oh my gosh, this connects to this thing. And you start to create just a library of material, but more importantly, you start to believe that you can do it. You start to believe that you're a writer. You believe you're a storyteller. And if you sit down and just draw one thing, you start to believe you're an artist. I meet so many authors or illustrators who aren't published yet, who say, well, I'm just an aspiring author. Well, I'm not really a writer. I'm not really an illustrator. And I think that if you can kind of drop that and start to identify as I am a writer because I sit every day and I write, you'll build that confidence and then you'll start telling more and more um, confident stories. And before you know it, you will have a published book. Like I truly believe that. I think breaking it into those little pieces that feel achievable I think that's a really powerful thing. Yeah, that's very good. Very true. Okay. Are there any groups, clubs, or organizations that you would recommend to other um, artists or authors that might have helped you in your career? Well, I mentioned the SCBWI, which I've been a member of for many years. Um, and I think that's the main one for me. It was a great way to meet other authors and illustrators, and it was a great um, resource for information. And I loved how accessible it was um, to beginners and how some of my kind of children's book heroes were there up on the stage giving keynotes or at, at the conference giving a presentation and everybody was so kind and welcoming and accessible. And I felt like oh, the, you know, this is a community I want to be part of. These are people who um, I admire and I like the, their their generosity and their kindness. So um, for me, the SCBWI, w, ugh, Squibby, as we call it, SCBWI was a great um, door to all of that and to inspiration and connection. So I'm grateful for for all that I've gotten from them over the years. Yeah, it is a great organization. It really is. Okay, now I have questions about you as a person. What is one thing that most people don't realize about you? Oh, this is a this is always a tricky question because I, <laughs> I realize everything about me and I just assume everyone else does. No, um, I think sometimes when I meet people over Zoom, they don't real, realize how tall I am. I'm pretty tall. So, um, that's okay. how tall are you? Well, I'm five foot 10, which is not the tallest, but, uh, I do meet people and sometimes they, I don't know, maybe I seem short over zoom. Do I seem short on zoom? I don't know. You seem average. <laughs> average. Yeah. There we go. Average. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a thing that's kind of universal after the pandemic though. We got used to meeting people virtually. That's so true. When you person it's like, oh, you're a three-dimensional living being with legs like <laughs> I didn't realize so there can be that that's funny true. moment of, of um that's aligning true. our virtual vision of them with the real one true very true okay had that moment yourself 
So what is or are your passions uh, when you're not writing and how do you make time for them? Um, <laughs> well, I like to spend time outside, get out of the studio when I can. Um, I love, you know, things like camping and um, hiking and stuff like that. I, um, <laughs> I'm a single mom. I have a little kid. I don't really make time for a lot of other things. <laughs> Uh, I feel like I should have more hobbies, but yeah, I think just being a parent um, takes up a lot of time, but it's also really inspiring. So it's a mm -hmm. lot of fun. Um, okay. I, you just, <clears throat> your um, little critter just answered one of my questions. <laughs> oh, is he back there causing, well, at least he's not right here, which is what he normally would be doing. <laughs> Like, yes. Let me stand on the keyboard and push all the buttons for you. Um, one of my questions is: uh, writers often have furry or feathered or otherwise non-human companions to <clears throat> help them through their work. And uh, do you have any? And yes, you do. I'm um, glad you met. <laughs> yeah, this is Houdini. He Houdini is um, an overgrown kitten, and he's very playful, and he likes to sit right in front of my desk or on top of my work and try to chew on my paintbrushes and generally cause all sorts of trouble, which is exactly That's what you so, do. So he helps you with your work. Yeah, yeah, he's very, very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he he keeps me from taking it too seriously, which is important. I see. Uh-huh, and he, he really wants you to take breaks. And he does, him. yeah. Yes. He encourages me to take breaks, which yes. I need. All the time <laughs> yes for sure okay. <laughs> so what does your writing space look like and what do you have to have around you when you're um when you're either writing or um or drawing or illustrating yeah, it, it depends i think i feel like i have different stations like i'm in my studio so you can kind of see a little bit of it here um the desk over there is my desk where i do all my paintings so you can see that behind me and then um, I have a kind of a dedicated room here. So I've got a big easel over there, which I use sometimes if I'm doing other kinds of painting. And then on the side of the room that I'm facing where you are is uh, kind of my computer desk. So this is like the uh, scanning things in area. This is the, um, you know, printers and doing meetings and that kind of stuff. So I have that. And then I mentioned my writing corner in the kitchen, which is basically just a lamp and a little table and a, uh, there's a rocking chair. And then every once a week I go and I work at a cafe because I just need to get out of my house. I work here in my house and um, and then I try to to write at least once a week something new. Because it's very easy to get sucked into what you're working on right now and what has a deadline and not be generating new work. So I, I try to protect that time and make sure I'm thinking of new stories so that a year from now, two years from now, I'll have books to talk about in, in meetings like this. So <laughs> those are kind of my main creative areas. Okay. And what do you have to have with you um, when you're writing or illustrating, like, do you have, have to have coffee or some kind of drink or food? Not really. Um, I try to make sure I drink water. <laughs> so I, I could just get really into uh, into painting or something and just forget. But I, I don't, especially if I'm painting, I don't keep too much on my desk because there's already so much going on. And I'm going to be that person that will stick my brush into my coffee if it's sitting there. So, um, so I try to not keep it on the desk because if it's, if it's there, you know, you're going to absentmindedly or spill it all over my painting or something. Like that. <laughs> That's what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> so I try to just stand up and go in the kitchen and do that in the kitchen so that I'm not, I'm not going to be spilling it all over something it shouldn't be on. <laughs> <laughs> and um <laughs> when you're when you're writing do you like perfect silence or do you like music and if music what kind when i'm writing i like 
um, very minimal noise. Well, I mean, I, it, I don't mean silence, but like uh, um, something like a nature sound, like rain is perfect, or just white noise, or um, it could be music, but it has to be very, very um, mellow. So it doesn't have any kind of really engaging melody, no lyrics for sure. So I like uh, most nature sounds um, for that because they're just very soothing, they're repetitive, and I can really drop into the writing zone. Uh, when I'm painting final art, I can listen to anything. So I often listen to audiobooks um, because then I'm getting to read at the same time. I think it uses a different part of my brain. So it's like if you were walking, you could listen to an audiobook or a podcast. So when I'm painting the finals, I can do that. Interesting. So you can listen to somebody else's work while you're mm -hmm. painting. Strangely. Wow. Yeah. Not, not if I'm, if I have to generate the idea, like if I'm sketching, then I can't do it. But if I'm just like looking at my sketch and making a larger version of it, then I can. Wow. That's great. Okay. Uh, now I have two more questions for you. One is where can people find your work aside from Annie's book, Stuff of Worcester? Um, and I have to, uh, I have to give a plug for Annie's. You can, you can get Jessica's, you can get, get Jessica's books. Uh, if, if we can, if we can get them, um, we can order them. Uh, you can call us at 508-796-5613, or you can email us at orders at anniesbooksworcester.com. And where else can people find your books? I, um, I think that buying local is always what I recommend. Um, you can, so your local bookstore is a great option. Also, you can get them at most uh, major retailers. Um, so any of your favorite booksellers should be able to order them or have them in stock. And I also have on my website, which is jessicalandon.com, I have a link where you can purchase the book and, um, I think I even have a bookshelf dot, um, I think I put together a bookshelf. So, uh, sorry, I'm super prepared here. So if you, if, yeah, there's a bookshop.org bookshelf that I've created with all of my books. So that's also a great way to order them if you want to see them all in one place. Okay. So you can find that on my website. All right. And my last question is how can we follow your work and share your awesomeness? <laughs> Well, you can find me at my website, jessicalannon.com. I've also got um, Instagram where I post kind of stuff about my work in progress and also some sketches when I'm going out and sketching. So that's a great um, option. I think my tag is Jessica Lannon. So it's just at, and then my first name, Jessica, last name, Lannon. Um, I'm also on Facebook and Twitter, which I don't use as much, but you can find the links to those on my website as well. So yeah, that's okay. it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. It's been great talking to you. Thanks for and having me. Appreciate you're it. You're welcome. And uh, we will hopefully be, um, be talking again. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much.